Jillian King Cargyle, and I will be your host today. <laughs> Welcome, Dean Barnhart. Hi, Jillian. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of Northern Illinois University STEM Read and the University Libraries, welcome to Future Telling. I'm Fred Barnhart, as Jillian said, and I have the privilege of being Dean of the University Libraries. We would like to thank the friends of the NIU Libraries and NIU STEAM for co-sponsoring this series. We'd also like to thank NIU's Division of Outreach, Engagement and Regional Development and the Division of Research and Innovation Partnerships for their commitment to community programming like this. These future telling conversations are at their core about hope. Hope that rational thinking will win out over fear, hope that science will continue to help us make sense of the world, and hope that by working creatively and cooperatively, we can bring about a brighter future. We believe that science fiction and science research go hand in hand and help us to imagine the future. If you're interested in supporting future telling, please go to go.niu.edu slash give future telling and make a donation of any size. We'd appreciate your support. And with that, I'm pleased to hand it back to my friend Jillian King Cargyle, director of NIU's STEAM, STEM Read, who will moderate tonight's talk and then invite you to participate in the Q&A session. The event will be recorded and posted on the Future Telling website as well. Thanks for joining us and, and thanks, Jillian. Thank you so much, Fred. Tonight's topic is greening our future. So human versus nature is one of literature's great classic themes, but somewhere around the industrial revolution, humans gained an unfair advantage in the battle. Nature is on the ropes. Climate disruption, sea level rise, and novel viruses are making it clear that if we truly defeat nature, everyone loses. So in tonight's webinar, we're going to talk to meteorologist Victor Gensini, mechanical engineer John Shelton, and author Jeff Vandermeer, whose writing explores themes related to the environment, animals, and our future. And the way this talk is going to work is we have pre-recorded the talk with Jeff Vandermeer and our scientists. And Jeff couldn't be here tonight, but he really wanted to participate. So we will be showing the pre-recorded interview. And then as soon as that's over, John Shelton and Victor Gensini will join us live to answer any questions you have. And you'll be able to post those questions in the Q&A box. So without further ado, we will get started with our interview with John Shelton, Victor Gensini, and Jeff Vandermeer. Thank you so much for being here today for the Future Telling event. Tonight, we're talking about greening our future. And my guests are Dr. Victor Gensini, Jeff Vandermeer, and John Shelton. All right, let's get started with Jeff. Thank you so much for being here. No, thanks for having me. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work? Uh, well, my name is Jeff Vandermeer, and uh, I guess my best known novel is Annihilation, which was made into a movie. Uh, I also have a novel called Born and Dead Astronauts, and the latest one is Hummingbird Salamander. Uh, they all tend to have environmental issues and uh, at, at the forefront. And while they're all very different novels, um, that's one reason why I keep uh, writing about environmental issues. I find different entry points, different ways of, of viewing them, uh, uh, from the surreal to the very realistic. Like I say, Hummingbird Salamander is probably the, the most realistic. Uh, I've also been involved in a lot of environmental issues. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling thing. Annihilation led to a lot of invites to science departments, uh, which led to me thinking more about what environmental activism should look like for me, which meant basically getting involved a lot in local politics, trying to unseat uh, local politicians who were basically the, the people who were in the way of, of doing stuff that would lead to a green future. Uh, and then also uh, uh, becoming part of organizations like Apalachicola uh, Riverkeeper, which uh, it is really important in trying to keep the health of, of one of our, our great uh, rivers uh, intact. So your books have uh, been called climate change fiction. Uh, how do your thoughts and anxieties about climate change play out in your work? Well, I think like in the latest one, Hummingbird Salamander, it was oddly easy. Any other book that would have been very difficult to write during the, the whole pandemic uh, shutdown, because I was still finishing it up towards the beginning of that. Of course, all the election anxiety. But in fact, it's a, it's a novel set in the, the present day, kind of maybe ends up about 10 seconds or 10 minutes into the future, as I put it. 
And so I just basically was able to channel all my anxiety into the, the main character who's increasingly isolated as she pursues uh, this mystery involving this dead eco-terrorist who may have set in motion something vast in scale she doesn't know yet uh, to kind of fulfill an idea that this dead woman has about what the future should look like. Um, and, um, you know, that, that's, that's one way of looking at it. There's, there's all kinds of other ways that I method act the anxiety into fiction. Uh, but another thing that helps really is the rewilding of our yard, the fact that I can um, go out there and do something every day uh, that's useful, uh, you know, with regard to wildlife, with regard to, to the biosphere. And it reminds me and keeps me anchored uh, uh, about what, 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 what's important and valuable. So you grew up in Fiji. How did that uh, perspective shape your ideas about nature and humans' relationship to nature? Well, it's kind of a two-pronged thing. I mean, my dad's a, a research chemist uh, and uh, is the head of the fire ant lab, the USDA fire ant lab in, in uh, Gainesville, Florida now. But in Fiji, he was studying the invasive rhinoceros beetle, which had a huge impact on uh, copra and uh, coconut uh, products and coconut trees. Uh, and so, you know, it was kind of a science-based <laughs> um, life there in terms of following him around to various islands and watching his process. Uh, while my mother was a biological illustrator who was mostly focused on things like uh, sea turtles and other organisms like that. So, so there was that. And then there was the fact simply that, you know, living on an island and particularly uh, Fiji, it, it is a tropical paradise or was at that time, but also, uh, you know, very complex uh, uh, dynamic in terms of the population, including uh, the, the, uh, the, the Indian population brought in by the British to, to uh, deal with the sugarcane plantation. So there's all kinds of things going on there. In addition to the fact that you, you are, I think, a little more aware uh, when you have a finite, you know, land resource uh, of nature and of, of uh, what you can take out of it and what you can't. You have talked about how your family is very immersed in science, um, your parents and um, lots of people in your life. So why did you choose uh, writing instead of science? <laughs> well, actually, I uh, was thinking about becoming a marine biologist, but I, my brain, although I, 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 I'm good at things like business process analyst, which is a job I had for a while, I'm not, I'm not necessarily, I, I just couldn't, like, the chemistry required in the biology aspects of it I just couldn't at that time like wrap my head around like it just didn't seem the right thing for me and I like to tell stories a lot uh, and so I think what what happened is basically I, I wrote a lot of stories that were about animals and about about nature um, and then with annihilation going forward that just became more and more more overt but, um, but yeah I've always been surrounded by, by scientists and um, and I think it's definitely influenced my fiction. So your characters often embed themselves in nature and find nature in unexpected places like an abandoned swimming pool, an empty lot, and urban environments. So where have you found nature in unexpected places? And what do these ecosystems or these, you know, unexpected ecosystems mean to you? Well, I think it's a really important issue because a lot of us uh, want to separate out wilderness from urban spaces in ways that are uh, not really uh, true to what the transaction is that's going on um, and also makes us perhaps uh, ignore as valuable ecosystems places that are fairly urban, um, maybe degraded, uh, but could still be valuable or useful and, and not something that we should just write off. And that's also because, um, you know, we're often talking about places where people are living uh, and we tend to want to you know, create uh, an invisibility around those places rather, rather than deal with the problems which often are interlocked with environmental issues. So I would say my, the ravine here that I live on is, is symptomatic, although it, it, it seems pristine, it's not. It's a, a, a system where the houses are built all along the uh, top and it was too steep to build down in the ravine. So there's a wooded ravine, you know, in the middle, uh, wooded uh, path, uh, but the fact of the matter is that over you know 40 years you've had everybody on the around the top basically um, allowing all kinds of fertilizer runoff, uh, all kinds of garbage and stuff, and and uh, you know nature has sprung up uh, despite that. And and I've done a lot of cleaning up of, of this area, but you know it, it's um, 
it's useful to me to, to recognize that this is the state of a lot of the world right now, and it's not a pristine state, but that doesn't mean that it's not valuable. That doesn't mean that, that we shouldn't um, preserve it and, and try to do better. Um, tell us more about hummingbird salamander. Yeah, so um, the, the main character is a security analyst who one day gets a, a, a missive from a dead woman that includes a key to a storage locker that uh, leads her to taxidermy of a, a hummingbird of a type that's extinct. And in fact, there's some issue as to whether even possessing the taxidermy of this extinct hummingbird may be illegal. And uh, that leads her down a rabbit hole of investigating who this dead woman was, who she has no contact with whatsoever. And she finds out that this woman was at one point accused of an environmental related bombing, uh, although not convicted. And so there's some ambiguity there as to whether this person, Silvina, was, uh, you know, pursuing a, a useful goal or a non-useful goal with regard to the environment in terms of her means. Uh, and as Jane goes along, she gets kind of environmental education because she's not somebody who's really thought about these issues, uh, even as she reaches a point where she would like to stop learning more about <laughs> what is going on uh, and, and comes into uh, increasing danger. And I, I like this this idea of kind of uh, supercharging what would normally be exposition about the environment because basically a lot of the clues lie in Jane researching this hummingbird, researching Sylvina's connection to it and researching what Sylvina's views on the environment were to kind of work back to who her enemies were uh, and, and all kinds of other things that are related to the central mystery of what Sylvina was up to. And um, I thought that was a really interesting way of, of turning information into story. Uh, and so it's super loaded with all kinds of um, environmental theory and uh, including, you know, environmental theory I don't agree with, <laughs> environmental views I don't agree with because I think it, it's useful uh, to, to have all of that in the kind of the laboratory of what this, this novel is. But what's interesting is it came out of talking to an environmental um, activism class at uh, Hobart and William Smith uh, Colleges in upstate New York, um, where they said they liked annihilation. I mean, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but they mostly <laughs> were looking at, we want something more direct about the environment. And I took that that seriously because they were all people going into, you know, a difficult field, uh, wanting to also have storytelling that was useful to them. And so I thought this was a way of doing it without being didactic. And then a, a real biologist from Hobart, William Smith, actually uh, created the hummingbird and the salamander all the details and I had to react to that uh, in writing the book. Yeah, I love that fact sheet that you sent about oh. the hummingbird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how much research do you do? How much research did you do in this book and what's your mm -hmm. typical research process as you uh, create these science fiction books? Uh, well, my, my process is usually to do the research years before I write the novel so that I anything I forget I figure is, is extraneous and anything that sticks will organically make it into the work in question. So there's that, there's the fact that I've been compiling this five to a thousand volume um, environmental library for the house um, that oddly, <laughs> we just happened to know it, the naturalist George Schaller's son. Um, and, and one day he said, oh yeah, my father's George Schaller, would you like some of his books? <laughs> so in our environmental library, we have some of George Schaller's personal collection, which I find kind of interesting. Um, but in addition to that, I, I've gotten kind of lazy, which is uh, another way of saying that I want to go directly to the source. So uh, when I was talking to Dr. Uh, Megan Brown, who again is uh, with HWS, uh, uh, Hobart and William Smith Colleges, uh, I was like, how would you like to create the hummingbird and the salamander for me? You're, you're an expert in, 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 in these types of organisms. Um, I'm not. If I, if I come up with it, there's going to be some, some disconnect there. Uh, and so that worked out uh, extremely well. It was much better than if I did research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is one of the great things about uh, being a successful novelist. You can just call people up, right? And they'll answer. And... Well, I mean, I think I could have <laughs> asked her even if I was an unsuccessful novelist. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned in a recent interview, and you touched on it a little bit earlier in this talk, that um, the idea of method writing in, or method acting in writing, and also the idea of improv in writing. So um, how does that work? Do you want to explain your writing process a little bit? 
Yeah, I mean, the best, the, the most famous example is that for Authority, the second book in the Southern Reach trilogy, I was stuck as to what the former director of the secret agency that's involved with investigating Area X, uh, what that house looked like. And I needed a scene where um, the, the new director actually breaks into the old director's house uh, because there's something that he needs to find out. So eventually I just was like, well, I'm just going to pretend to be this character and I'm going to break into my own house. <laughs> and uh, so I crept into the backyard. Um, I was doing a weird kind of cartoon villain creep, uh, which I don't know why I was doing that. Didn't need to do that. The neighbor kids saw me, had no idea what was going on. And I broke into my own house and, and I just remembered everything that happened and I wrote it into the scene and it worked perfectly. So sometimes it's a method of moving through writer's block is to really inhabit the character. Other times it's just simply really important for me to imagine that I'm the character doing things throughout my day to get a sense of who they are uh, than myself. And that, that works very well. And there's a lot of um, other acting techniques I won't get into, but I, I think that they, drama and acting techniques can work really well uh, for fiction. I follow you on Twitter, and this is another thing that you talked about a little bit, but I would say 90 to 95% of your posts, maybe more than that, are about your yard and your mm -hmm. webcam and the interesting creatures that you find there. And before we started, you said that you might have a box turtle emergency <laughs> that you needed to take care of. Um, so what, do you, what are you doing in that environment, and how does that fuel uh, your work? Well, basically, when we, we bought this new house, we discovered that almost every implant in the yard was invasive. Uh, and at the same time, we discovered that there were a lot of things like there were 35-year-old box turtles here who were beginning to suffer over the fact that they didn't really have the proper food um, and they didn't really have the proper environment. And uh, so we thought about that. And then we started to get rid of the, pull out the, the invasive plants and plant a lot of native stuff that would normally be found in a North Florida ravine. Um, and that restored a lot of biodiversity very quickly, which I found very encouraging. But the other thing about it and why I tweet so much about it is because it's so scalable. It's not a, it's a very democratic process. Somebody can participate uh, by not raking their leaves and providing a leaf layer that, you know, skinks and ringtail snakes and others actually need to be in to survive along with fireflies. You can do it by not mowing your lawn. You can do it by replacing a grass lawn with something that's more viable for pollinators. Um, but you can you can usually do these things in small increments. So anyone with any kinds of resources can do it. We did it on a large scale, but you can do it on a small scale too. And so, you know, in addition to the fact people would come up to me and say, oh, I, I like annihilation. And actually I get quite a few people saying I went into environmental science because of annihilation. Um, I now get a lot of people every week who who actually are changing how they view the property they own or the apartment with the balcony where they can actually put wildflowers outside. Uh, so I see a, a measurable change uh, and a call to action that actually works. And that's why I focus on it so much. Okay, awesome. Well, we are going to come back to Jeff in a few minutes, but let's move on to John Shelton. You know, of course, my name is uh, John Shelton. I'm an assistant professor here at Northern Illinois University. Um, I'm in mechanical engineering. Um, but uh, my main focus coming here to NIU has really been about sustainability. And, and making sure that we're living in a sustainable future. Uh, so a lot of my research has been focused on renewable energy, renewable energy resources, um, working with a lot with solar energy, concentrated solar power. Uh, of course, in the state of Illinois, there isn't a lot of sun, especially in the winter time, but uh, there's a lot of, lot of research that could be obtained from that, that type of investigation that could be applied to all over. In addition to that, um, I've recently gotten into uh, how to live in a, a mega city. Uh, one of the, I just watched a video uh, from one of the channels on YouTube called B1M. And there was a really good video that caught my attention about uh, the, the types of living spaces that we'll start to be living in in the next 50 years or in the next 100 years. And that really caught my attention. And I, I started looking at ways that I, as an engineer, could, could support that. So um, what I did was, so I, I took some of the data that was in the video, like for example, uh, uh, in the top 10 cities in 2050 are gonna be having a minimum of 20 million people in the city. Uh, in, in 
2100, which is not actually not too far away from us, uh, the largest city is going to have 88 million people. How do you how do you sustainably live in a city that big? And so one of the areas that I've been focusing on is is just very simple stuff like when you take a shower in the morning. If you take a hot shower, it feels good when it comes down, but a lot of that energy that, go, that went into heating the water basically goes down the drain, literally. Is there a way for us to kind of capture that energy in a way that we can store it or potentially use it at another time so that we're not totally dependent on, on just the overall energy consumption? So since we live near the city of Chicago, uh, Chicago is, is a good model. Uh, a lot of the buildings in the city of Chicago were made pre-World War, 1945 and before. So a lot of the infrastructure there is, is pretty old, which is not really sustainable. So we're looking at ways in which we can retrofit these buildings so that people that are living in multifamily buildings could actually benefit from that. So uh, I have a, I've done a lot of research with that with a, a lot of my students and looking at ways in which we could take these multifamily units or multifamily buildings that are actually consuming a lot of energy in a way that we can either capture some of that waste heat or actually store it for other times when, when people are not considerably there or maybe are using it at another time when they could come and make that available to them. So that's what we're doing right now. Okay, excellent. Yeah, that's really interesting. The idea of not just um, cutting down on energy use, but reusing energy. So I'm I'm interested to see how that idea plays out and some of the other things that we're going to talk about. All right, let's move on to Victor. I'm, I'm Victor Jensini. I'm an associate profession, professor here at uh, NIU in the Department of Geographic and Atmospheric Science, soon to be environmental science and atmospheric science, something like that. We're going through a department merger. So I focus a lot on climate change, uh, specifically climate change and extreme weather. Um, and I love to show this slide when I'm talking to members of the public, just to understand sort of the top five threats to society um, in terms of their likelihood. And so all the little green chiclets up here are essentially uh, have to do with environmental threats, whether that be from climate change, rising greenhouse gases, natural disasters, which you'll see a, a term that is a term that I despise as no disaster is natural and natural in nature. Um, but uh, really focusing on, on extremes. And so these, these storms, super storms, uh, significant wildfires, tornadoes, uh, and hail are actually a big part of my research. And, you know, if you think about these on a year-to-year -year basis, of course, we don't have the 2020 plot up here. That will most certainly be coronavirus and widespread pandemic. But extreme weather and climate really do play a significant role in not only things like economic loss, as I'm gonna show you on the next slide, but are becoming increasingly important for things like environmental and justice, uh, especially when it comes to who experiences the brunt of climate change impacts and vulnerability. Um, if you look through time, of course, the global insured catastrophic losses due to weather and climate, this is from Guy Carpenter, basically a reinsurance company, uh, looking at losses through time, you see this exponential growth. And so it's, it's really easy for a lot of people to look at this and say, this has got to be climate change. Um, there's this huge, you know, increase in the amount of disasters and losses that we have. A lot of this is actually population driven, but also people living in extremely vulnerable areas. Um, so this creates sort of a twofold problem, right? We have this increasing population problem, um, but we also have this, this potential increase or changes at least due to, due to climate change. And I think probably most everybody watching this, this recording um, is familiar with the climate stripes. And uh, so I wanna take some time to address the idea of natural variability versus anthropogenic climate change, which is what we're experiencing right now, this sort of temperature anomaly chart that you're looking at here from left to right in the global recorded instrument era has seen this market increase in terms of global average temperature, which is 
really created uh, some alarm bells going off for scientists in terms of the rate of change. It's not necessarily the actual values that we're experiencing, but it's the rate at which this increase is happening, which is not consistent with natural variability or sort of natural change that we experience over the course of say hundreds of thousands of years. Every time an extreme weather event happens, I have reporters knocking on my door asking, was this due to climate change? And it's sort of an ill-posed question because you're perhaps not really understanding what the phenomena is uh, that climate change is impacting and, and really climate attribution, which is really looking back at a particular event and saying climate change caused this is still in its infancy. And so scientists at this time uh, are not able to look at a specific event and say that event was due to climate change. Um, it's a difference between weather and climate, right? Which I'll show you uh, in, the, in the next slide. Um, I love this analogy, weather is your mood, climate is your personality, perhaps better uh, if you're a softball or a baseball fan, um, weather is an at bat and climate is your batting average, right? So one plate appearance doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you're either a good or a bad hitter when it comes to a baseball analogy. So it's, it's difficult, and especially as we get to smaller scales. So when you look at things like hailstorms or tornadoes, as we go to the smaller and smaller phenomena, it's much more difficult to paint attribution from climate change to those events. As we back out to broader hazards, like flooding and wildfire, much easier to see the fingerprint of climate change on those events. But small scale things like tornadoes and, and hurricanes, which are a majority of my research, are still difficult in their infancy. Of course, speaking of those broader impacts, we have great phenomenal data visualization analyses that have happened over the last 10 years to really show us visually the impact that climate change is happening on our planet. This is a graphical illustration of the sea ice thickness uh, in the Arctic, basically showing you the, the decrease over time um, in the footprint of ice. And unfortunately, if this trend continues, it will not be very long before we see an ice-free Arctic. Um, what that means depending on where you live, is, is still a, a scientific question that is being resolved. Uh, but it is in a trend and uh, it, it is one that we would consider as scientists to be alarming because of the rate of change. Again, not the fact that it will be ice-free. We know the Arctic has been ice-free in the past, but the rate at the change, this, this idea of the first derivative with respect to time. I wanna just pause to say that no disaster is natural. I know we, we read all about natural disasters, but they're social constructs. If humans didn't live there or we didn't have things in the way of the natural hazard, then it wouldn't be a disaster. And so there's this great paper by Squires and Hartman in 2006 that discusses the idea that disasters are social constructs and influenced by societal uh, and, and the economics and so many more things than just understanding that you know this disaster uh, whether it's uh, a built environment, right? The changes that we see from, say, the early, uh, the early 20th century till, till now. We love our beachfront property. We love building commercial buildings where we have beautiful views of the ocean. Unfortunately, those are extremely vulnerable areas with high rates of exposure to multitudes of natural disasters. Pictures every day in the news, just like this, right? Flooding, wildfires. Tornadoes. Here's an example of the Joplin, Missouri tornado before and after over the Joplin High School. You get to see these pictures of destruction and damage, but you have to realize that the tornadoes were happening well before humans ever put a city or a town in front of the footprint of that tornado. So a lot of my research is really focused on taking this large scale climate data, feeding it into very high resolution models and telling a story. I'm not as good as a storyteller as Jeff is, I'm more on other brain, my other side of the brain uh, is, is more knowledgeable when it comes to quantitative reasoning and science. And I do a lot of computer programming and running climate models to try to understand the potential for change. Um, and so there, there are a lot of things that come out of that, but one of those is really investigating how potentially economic injustice and climate change will play a role in these hazards as we go forward. And we know it's not just gonna be the hazard, it's gonna be things like this, what we call the expanding footprint of these mega cities that John was just talking about. As our cities continue to grow in size, I take Chicago, for example, the metropolitan bow wave that is happening to the west of Chicago uh, into the exurban and uh, out of the suburban areas. 
is causing larger and larger targets on the dartboard for these uh, disasters. And so up at the top, we have basically a hypothetical tornado path from the past. And as our cities grow, right, this is a very simple concept, uh, but as our cities grow, we, we affect more and more of that human built environment, causing more and more loss when we start looking at insured losses. So it really is a two pronged problem of the potential for change in these, in these things due to climate change, but also the fact that we have these expanding human built environment. And I'll leave everybody with, with sort of a little exercise here in forecasting weather analysis and forecasting, and then, and then a slide of some musings to think about when we think about how climate change is gonna impact our lives um, in the coming century. If you think about a daily forecast for weather, there's basically a two by two, what we call contingency table that can be developed from that forecast. So let's say newscaster comes on at 9 p.m. and says, there is rain tomorrow, 90% chance. Okay, that's a forecast, right, for tomorrow. Here are the potential outcomes, right? If you forecast, yes, that there will be rain and rain occurs, your customer is happy, right? If you forecast no and the rain doesn't happen, that's a, what we call a correct null, right? So you made, a, you made a good forecast, but you just said that the event was not gonna happen. Sometimes that's really easy to do depending on how extreme the event is. So in both cases here, we have basically what's called a forecast hit, that's a good thing, or a correct null. The two other things that possible outcomes are what we call either a type one or a type two error. The first case here is a type one error that basically says, I forecasted rain, rain did not actually occur, but since I forecasted rain, you brought your umbrella and you were at least prepared, right, for rain. That's a type one error, basically what we call a fal false alarm. The worst case scenario, and this is especially true for climate change, is that I forecast that it's not going to happen and it happens. That's a type two error. You did not bring your umbrella. It rained on you outside and you had a very bad day, right? Because of my forecast. And so what we want to do when we're looking at science is mitigate the time, usually try to mitigate the number of type two errors, these misses in the forecast. We can trade some false alarms for some misses in, in our predictions. And so I leave you with this thought slide here is that science operates on control and experimental designs. And so when you think about that in terms of climate change, we have one earth, one earth. And in many ways, we are in the experiment. We cannot fly, right, to weekend earth and just chill out and see how things go here for a hundred years and then fly back and test our control versus our experiment. And so that is a that argues even more for not making a type two error. Many climate scientists say if we make a type one error, you know, the worst thing that happens is we get cleaner air, cleaner water, right, and a better, a more efficient economy. If we make a type two error, we have a serious, we're, we're risking a serious, uh, potentially climate step function that will spin us into essentially places that we're not sure where we're going. Um, which is cause for concern. I deal a lot with questions about natural variability. This is natural variability. It's not climate change. Humans have nothing to do with this. We can't possibly influence the environment that much. It's an absolute zombie theory that needs to be put to rest. Natural variability happens over the order of hundreds of thousands of years. And what we're seeing in terms of Earth's climate change is happening over the course of a human lifetime. We're the first to acknowledge that we're still learning and have a lot to learn, but we will see increasing disasters as we go forward in the next 100 years, purely due to this expanding built environment of exposure, but also the potential for increase and change in these hazards that we see, whether it's hurricanes, flooding, wildfire, et cetera. The average human has no concept of the problem. We experience weather locally. We walk outside, we put on our coat. It's raining outside in Northern Illinois right now. We have no concept of what's happening in Australia or South Africa. Most people experience weather, but the problem is climate. The problem is at a global scale, making it very, very challenging for the lay person to really understand or wrap their head around. And finally, you can't talk about climate change and potential without talking about the experience of impacts and who will be influenced, usually speaking, 
in a, uh, when, when you're looking at this, you're looking at it in terms of vulnerability. And this is where climate justice comes in and the fact that we will have climate refugees in the next 50 to 100 years that are gonna be experienced the brunt of the impacts from climate change, usually and typically in very vulnerable uh, areas of the planet. With COVID, we were able to engineer our way out. It's gonna be a lot harder to engineer our way out of sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere and figuring out how to solve at the end of the day, which is a very wicked problem and not a problem that one person can solve alone. And yet we all have to solve it together. Uh, and many, many, this is gonna require cooperation from many, many countries. And really the human, uh, you know, homo sapiens as, as a total, right, are gonna have to try to figure out how to engineer and how to figure out how to solve this wicked problem. So um, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and we can come back to the discussion. All right, on that happy note. <laughs> so uh, I have another uh, quote from one of Jeff's books. This comes in book three of the Southern Reach trilogy um, in acceptance. And Jeff wrote, the only solution to the environment is neglect, which requires our collapse. <laughs> so that's at a dark moment for the characters in the book. But I, I was thinking about that quote um, also during the start of the pandemic when we saw these lockdowns and we saw nature returning to um, very urban environments. You know, even in my subdivision, I saw herds of deer like running through the subdivision. I saw foxes and lots of different things. You know, we saw um, dolphins in the canals of Venice. So short of uh, the collapse of human society, what are some of the ways <laughs> that we can deal with this problem? And I think I'll start with John on this. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think that with regards to uh, finding a solution, it, it will require a, a significant thumb, a collective thumb from society to kind of tip the scales in a particular direction because it, it won't require, it will require more than just incremental changes or incremental in, uh, inputs into the system. Um, it, it's almost like when you're strumming a string, if you kind of pluck the string very lightly, the, the change will only be minimal. But if you really pluck it really hard, it's gonna, gonna really even probably break the string, which is what kind of what we need to do at this time. Um, I think that uh, as, as was alluded before, we're, our society itself is changing with regards to the way that we live, how we live, how we interact with people. I think there's a, there's a lot of discussion about, it is the idea of the way we live right now with a whole bunch of nation states interacting with each other. Is that concept gonna have to, to change in order to actually function? Maybe because we're, we're living in these congregated groups of people that that kind of have a different way of living. Like for example, in the Northeast corridor, there's this huge agglomeration from Boston to DC that kind of is considered one big massive group. And then we have the Chicagoland region that includes Pittsburgh, Cleveland, uh, Wisconsin. And then we have LA going from Sacramento to, from, to, to San Diego. Maybe these are these, these centers where, where people can make these collective changes to these regions at, from a significant thumb in their local region, maybe that's where we can go ahead and start making these changes and then they can radiate out or maybe in increase the pluck as we radiate out from those uh, little city centers. I just got a great idea for a book for Jeff. Because <laughs> he's such a good storyteller. Sure, hit me up. I, I don't have anything else to do right now. <laughs> no, 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 no. A book called, you go back to this idea that I just mentioned, Control Earth. What about a story of this read, you know, these people that are able to pick up and fly to a new earth and conduct an experiment on a control planet and redesign society and buildings and environmental structures and everything in regards to a scientific control experiment, which is not turning the knobs of climate change and CO2 and looking at what this, I don't need, you know, this is where you come in, you're the storyteller, but I wonder if there's something there of like a, you know, control earth, a science fiction novel. Well, I, I certainly understand the, 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 the value of the idea that the, the problem is the same 
problem I have with the whole idea of colonizing exoplanets in the first place, which is that there's something already there. There's, uh, you know, it, I don't know that we, <laughs> I feel like we don't actually have, <laughs> we, we need to focus on the, ex, the, the planet we live on and not, uh, not basically invade another one because that's really what it would be. Um, we don't have uh, another earth, like you said. Um, the other thing is that the quote that, that, that Julian, that you quoted is um, from an MIT semio textbook, uh, Marxist in philosophy. And it's, uh, acceptance has a lot of quotes from sources that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, but the, the, the kind of subtext of what I get out of that quote is that we need to recognize that the world without us in it would be better off. Uh, and think about that when we're coming up with our solutions. It's not that I think that we should be gone. It's that we need to be humble about our footprint on this planet. Um, you know, and some of that is in what John was talking about in terms of making our cities more efficient, uh, acknowledging that, that if we could do that, that that would be really important. The other is the, 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 the fact that we need to be more climate resilient in general, um, even thinking about what we plant, because the other thing is that uh, I see a real disconnect between uh, green tech sometimes uh, and the, the very vital fact that if we destroy all our habitats, and I think Victor uh, kind of alluded to this in showing the beachfront property and everything, uh, we'll be screwed anyway, uh, no matter what we do with sustainable energy. We won't have a place to live and we won't actually have any uh, working earth system, so to speak. Uh, so, 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 so that's the, the kind of nexus that I think really needs some work. I mean, we're seeing solar power get very extractive. We're seeing like in, in Portugal for lithium mines, we're seeing uh, tons of woodland being cut down, animals slaughtered, and then they just like do the mining. Um, so, so what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of sustainability efforts now that look like extractive fossil fuel. And it may mean that as on the back end, the, the power is clean, but the hidden costs uh, that shouldn't be there is still there. So what I want to see is a lot more imagination on the front end when someone comes up with an idea to get out of that extractive model. Uh, and I think that if we don't, then, you know, all the hidden costs Victor's talking about are going to be a real problem because that's weighing on us. If our solar power isn't actually clean, if we're actually, while we're creating solar power, also <laughs> cutting into natural carbon sequestration and things like that, then, then we really... Uh, don't know what we're doing. Um, no one's mentioned Bitcoin. I know that there's some debate back and forth on exactly how energy extractive it is, um, but it seems to be becoming more so. Um, there's all kinds of other things that we're going to have to think about and kind of stamp out uh, while we're working on the sustainability stuff, if we're going to get to the point uh, where we have mega cities in 20, uh, in, 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 in like 100 years. <laughs> Um, because I'm not actually convinced we're going to get to that point if we don't um, stay under two degrees uh, uh, of temperature change. And as Victor indicated, uh, we're really in danger of, of not even hitting that mark. Um, so, you know, one reason that I, I stress the environmental stuff is because people right outside of their window can engage in a way that maybe makes feels connected in, in their body and, and is very physical. And then that maybe leads to the more abstract concept of the sustainability and everything else. Um, but it is a difficult and hard equation that we have to deal with. And I think that both John and Victor um, pointed that out. But, but here's the thing, the horror to me and the, this, the pessimism is in not engaging, um, not engaging with the facts. That's, the, that's where I find the pessimism. I don't find the facts themselves um, not optimistic. If you don't have the facts to work with, you can't get anywhere. Uh, so you can't have hope because any hope you have is a false hope. Um, and I, I appreciate the, the attention to detail that both Victor and John showed in what they presented. So, so one of the things that I, I find very interesting in what you're saying is that, uh, so I'm, I'm a big Star Trek The Next Generation fan. Um, I think it's, it, it has a really good con concept behind it. And one of the things in, in The Next Generation that I find interesting is that there is a mentality to those that are a member of, of uh, Starfleet or are part of the Federation with, with regards to, to the idea of certain concepts like money or whatever the case may be. They've already established in their mind that if they accepted that this is the life that they're living in. And I think that 
with regards to any type of change that we're anticipating to have, the mentality is going to be delayed as well. So if we make that change or we make some sort of change to that, to whatever we want to be, let's say we are able to, to get to some sort of sustainability level or, or reduce the impacts of, of climate change to the point that we have to, that we're, we're living in a way that is sustainable, the mentality is going to be delayed as well to the point that it, it's going to take a while, but eventually you'll get there and then everyone will be utopic in, in their, their thinking. But that delay from that, the, the little gap between the two where the actual change actually is made and then the mentality, there's going to be some significant amount of time. And how do we mm. describe or, or, or help people reformulate the mm. way they think so that they will be eventually able to accept that. And that's, that's something that would probably be really good to kind of explore as a, as a writer or anything like that. Yeah, no, because what you're talking about is the gap between what we can do and policy that implements it in a way, right? I mean, mm -hmm. because the mentality you're talking about, I mean, I, I see it locally in Tallahassee. We have politicians, Democrats who say they believe in climate change, they believe this and that or the other, but their idea of sustainability is to make our city sustainable by 2065. <laughs> Right, so they don't really believe in it, you know, and so they might they might actually implement things that are sustainable, but they're doing it on a time frame uh, and in a way that is actually not sustainable because I think of that gap, you know, what I'm saying it's like they still can't quite get it that we're actually in it right now, you know, like the, the information that Victor presented is not really living in their head. Um, but that I think that's an amazing point that I haven't really thought about the, the delayed mentality to the actual like the instrumentality or the physicality of the change that's occurring. Um, um, and how do you, I guess, how you, how do you lessen the impact of that or the penalty of that, right? Yeah, I think um, there's an interesting point to what you've all been saying. Of it's, it's not just how we're living, it's also where we're living. And this mm -hmm. idea of, you know, mega cities taking over more and more of this natural landscape and kind of really ending up in the path of these um, weather events. So we saw with the Joplin tornado uh, that Victor showed the picture of. So that was a case where they had a clean slate and could rebuild and they did put in a lot of green initiatives, um, but that's not something that you could do in the heart of Chicago. So, so what are some of the ways you balance with it? Like this is the ideal technology that we could be using to this is the infrastructure that we have and this is the resources that we have. Well, well, I, I do think that, so the city of Chicago, they had their own um, strategic plan implemented where they had a vision for what they want to be. Uh, I forgot what their original time frame was. And then they worked through, uh, like was mentioned before, a series of policies that they tried to implement uh, and, and try to you know, work with community leaders, work with community uh, business leaders to kind of try to change the mentality by offering uh, incentives from, uh, from the power utility suppliers to really kind of try to drive that change. But in reality, it, it, it might actually have to take something that is really big because Chicago is an old city. New York is an old city. And you know, we're talking about buildings that have been there for almost a hundred years. And no matter how many different changes to adding sustainability infrastructure to it, like adding our uh, wastewater heat recovery systems that we're trying to develop here at NIU, they're still, they're still old buildings. And there's only so much that you can do to these buildings to make it sustainable. A lot of the new buildings have new, new ways to, to, to try to mitigate some of these issues, but even still, like looking a hundred years from now, these buildings might actually be like the way we're looking at the 1945 buildings. They may have things that we could improve on then. So it's only always going to be an, an, trying, an improvement process in which we are trying to strive for something that we really don't know what that end goal is. We have visions for it. We have the Jetsons, we have Star Trek, we have, but we don't really know what that final end product looks like. And that's where, you know, the scientists and engineers, they really try to visualize what that is, but in the end, we really don't know. So um, 
you can only attempt to, to make an incremental step forward, but that direction to where it is, is still unknown. So if one of the biggest barriers is ourselves, um, <laughs> both uh, just making people aware of the problem and um, getting people to see the urgency of the problem, how do we change people's hearts and minds about these issues? My best way to talk with people about climate change has been at the local scale. Um, you know, understand how, how they're, what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, what their livelihood is, what, what do they do for a job, um, and bringing climate change impacts to their backyard, right? Talking about climate change as, as if it's sort of a weather and local problem rather than this large scale, the thermometer continues to increase, right? There is temperature. Because if you tell them that, they generally look at that and say, well, does two degrees Celsius really matter? And it might not matter where they live, but it's a huge deal in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, right? And this goes back to the discussion of climate change will not be felt the same way everywhere. There will be regional impacts from climate change, whether you live in the Great Lakes or, or near the Gulf of Mexico, uh, it, it, it will be variable. One of the things that I find fascinating in terms of motivating people, if you look throughout history, is that we had this mentality change that John was talking about and then this rapid expansion and development of technology because it was profitable. And so when these, you know, one motivating factor for the private sector is always greed and, and privatization and being able to make profit off of engineering capabilities of redesigning structures and so on. And so if you look at how fast we got to where we are through the industrial revolution and the ramp up of CO2 production, the opposite end to come of that would be some sort of reverse engineering that is profitable or changes the way a broad sector of people think and drives this mentality that John is talking about in a different direction, which then still has a gap, but will eventually lead to action. Um, that's generally what I think about when I try to bring, but, it, but you're right, just talking to people um, you know, through a, a seminar web series and talking, showing all these beautiful slides that I have doesn't really mean much unless you can bring it to their backyard and let them know how they can make a difference um, in their home, in their lifestyle, uh, and then be able to spread that information to their friends, families, neighbors, et cetera. Yeah, and I thought, Victor, that, that the way you presented things was extremely effective. And I've, I've definitely seen presentations that were not effective. So that the, the way the messaging occurs is, is extremely important. Um, and I agree with the local thing because um, you can give money to international organizations and stuff, but you know, knowing who your politicians are and what they're actually doing on this issue or not doing, and you know, in North Florida, where there's also the issue of it being so incredibly biodiverse, so there's so much to lose, which also does mean losing a certain amount of carbon sequestration um, or whatever you want to call it, but also other things. Um, it, 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 there's an environmental thing, there's a sustainability thing, and there's other issues. And so what we currently have is basically developers tearing Florida apart at the same time that these same developers don't believe in climate crisis. So you know, if you are in Florida, for example, and even at a county level, if you know who your politicians are, if you can effectively organize to the point where you can vote some people out, you can actually make a difference uh, in, in how some of this goes down. Um, I know it varies by region as to what is effective, what you can do and what you can't do and by country. I mean, there's obviously countries where you're not gonna be able to vote your politician out. Um, but, but I do think the local thing is extremely important. And, and, and if you're looking for something and you're frozen, try that. Just try, just try to look more closely at what's around you and see if there's some way that you can be of use. I agree. I, I, I think that there's one more critical component that, that probably isn't given enough credit. And mm -hmm. it, is, it is our entertainment. I think our entertainment that highlights the the benefits of these changes in a, in a sustainable way really leaves an impact on the minds of people. And a lot of people go to movies, or they watch TV series, or they listen to books or read books uh, to escape. But if we are able to provide a visualization of their escape in a way that's realistic to people, then it, it, it becomes 
easier for them to see themselves in an environment that's different. Um, you know, I, I refer to Star Trek a lot, but there's there's all these other uh, other, you know, at least for me, TVs and movies. You know, a, a good example would be Stargate. Stargate's a futuristic type of of world, uh, and it lasted for ten seasons, and people still talk about it. I uh, Ready Player One was also talking about life in in Columbus, and in the not too distant future, in 2045. It was only in the movies for one you know, one movie season, but it, it 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 its ability to provide impact into the mindset of what it's like to live in a mega city like Columbus in 2045 wasn't really put out there because people didn't have that constant impact on their their psyche or their mentality as to what it's like to live in a mega city. So being able to put uh, the realities of of the impacts of of these changes or even the visualizations of what it could like could life could be like in a sustainable world uh, would be a really good way to to make that change not only at the, the broader level but very very much at the local level it's a great point john i you know i would say though for every star trek we have an idiocracy <laughs> true, true, true. And so there's i think a segment that does speak that language and certainly that would resonate there's also another section, uh, often very highly fractioned section of the population that refuses, right? Mm -hmm. Or subscribes to a narrative. And I think that requires education and coming to their level, coming to their backyard. Certainly entertainment can be in that. And I think that's, that's certainly an avenue uh, that can be pursued. But we are literally dealing with many, many people that are just have no clue uh, what the problem is, why it's important, or why they should care. And I think are hesitant to even engage in conversation. True. So the pandemic has been a disruptor in so many ways. How do you see it as influencing um, your areas of work? And do you see it as a way to inform people about uh, changing climate and issues that would come with it? Well, I, you know, obviously there's a lot of really bad things happening in the world uh, as soon as just yesterday. Um, but one of the things I think may, maybe one of the positive things that came out of the pandemic for me was self-reflection and the ability to spend a little bit more at time at home and understand what's important, being in your backyard more, understanding your local environment a lot more, not traveling as much, All right? There's a lot of, of unforeseen benefits um, that, that came, including for me, not going to any scientific conferences, uh, which is something as a scientist we do. We fly all around the world, right, mm -hmm. doing science. Um, it was actually nice, <laughs> maybe a nice break of pace to really be able to sit home, read books, and get more in tune with, with local, right, versus a very globalized society that we lived in. Uh, and now has many, many ways has been completely... Uh, you know, I wouldn't say completely stopped. Obviously, there has been a lot of uh, resurgent activity ongoing lately, but uh, that's one of the things that uh, I was able to sort of reflect on uh, during the pandemic. You know, for me, it's been, uh, it has allowed me to see uh, or quantify portions of my life in terms of energy consumption. Like, I didn't realize how much of my energy consumption was devoted to driving to work every day or or using that energy for whatever the case may be and so uh, that's that's definitely a, a, one of the, the things that I've obtained the most from the pandemic um, being able to to see to be able you know when you're when you're in the middle of life it's very difficult to see what's going on in life and the pandemic says no stop you gotta you gotta see what's going on and it really did and it helped me kind of see where I was spending my energy, spending my time, spending my resources and reassess things for, for that matter. I think here in Tallahassee, uh, there's been a, a wider awakening of uh, an awareness that, for example, the intergovernmental agency that oversees what the city and county's future is gonna look like in terms of infrastructure projects and other things that quite frankly are extremely important with regard to climate resiliency are failing us and also are completely not within our control anymore. 
we literally have a situation where the city and county commissioners do not have complete control over what this agency does, which means people don't have control over what this agency does. Um, and that's incredibly important to the topic we're talking about, you know, whether we're a mega city or not, because the kinds of projects they want to do all reek of the 1950s or the 1990s, right? And so we'll have our solar power farm, sure, but we, but that's it. Like, like we're renowned for our, our solar power farm, but in terms of the actual projects they're creating, it doesn't support sustainability. Uh, so I think people have woken up to that because they were home, because they were more on the internet, frankly, um, and, and also because they had a better awareness locally of uh, just how much development has been going on. So it's a kind of a microcosm of some of the issues that are occurring more widely um, that are working against our ability to be sustainable. And I do think it has woken up a lot of people politically. Okay, so what are your hopes then? Um, you know, ideally in the next 25, 50 years, what could we see that would, you know, completely go in the opposite direction of that collapse <laughs> that we talked about? Every single one of our elected leaders understands climate science and the important of, uh, <laughs> importance of environmental sustainability. I mean, we need a lot more young people. Uh, we need a lot more leaders in the climate and environmental, environmental sustainability space to get into positions of decision-making beyond board of trustees, panels, anybody who's making a substantial decision about environmental justice and environmental change uh, to be leading our populations. I mean, that to me is is how we're going to lead in the next 100 years versus just looking at the problem and saying, and now we can kick this can down the road for another, you know, another term, another cycle. I agree. I agree 100%. Um, I, I know for Victor, it probably he probably sees the same thing, but there there are a crop of students now that are coming in to, to our, our classrooms and into our, our research labs that have that passion for sustainability, for climate science, for climate change analysis. And, and I just hope that that continues to grow uh, over the next 50 to 100 years, the idea of it being something that's only resolved to or relegated to a small community it actually permeates the entire society so that is it like you said it doesn't it's not something that you have to force it's just something that everyone does mm -hmm. so that's my my hope for the next 50 to 100 years yeah i mean i think i'm i'm hopeful for a couple of reasons uh, one and this will sound not hopeful but the fact of the matter is that if we had the awareness that you're talking about uh, now 20 years ago we might we might actually not be in so much trouble, which is to say that there has been a huge growth in it. And that is extremely hopeful, even if we're now in a much more dire uh, situation. Um, also, the fact that quite simply, um, we have to keep, I think just in general, for me as a layperson, it's important to realize that there's no point of no return in that everything we do to be helpful in this arena will save something, right? Um, that, you know, if a lot of people are affected, there may still people be people who will not be affected based on what we do now. Uh, and the same for, for the environment. And, and so, you know, I see a lot of people say, is it too late? <laughs> and it's like, in a way it's never too late because there's always something to salvage. Uh, and that may not sound extremely hopeful, but, but I think it's important to not uh, get into like a zero sum game over it. Uh, because again, like Victor said, we don't have another uh, planet to move to, so we have we have to make this work. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think about the Lauren Isley story, the star thrower. You know, it it makes a difference to this starfish that I'm throwing back into the ocean. I had a question for Victor um, with regards to climate science uh, and mega cities. Uh, has there been any uh, discussion on the impacts of these huge mega centers of populations? on the local weather, uh, weather science or the climate science of that particular area? And what are the ways in which we can, can relate significant changes in policy to the local weather of that particular megacity? Great question. Um, 
I'll speak primarily on research in and around Chicago. Um, we can, what we call downscale, like what I showed you before, come to really, really high resolution scale to that we're actually modeling the urban, the urban corridor. So urban canyons between buildings, we can model the, hyd the accelerated hydrological cycle given the fast runoff that happens in cities because of impermeable uh, surface structures. Um, yeah, we're very well aware of how large cities are changing their local weather and climate, in including things as simple as just changing air quality, which is, is a topic that actually doesn't get a lot of attention. But in Chicago, if you've ever flown out of O'Hare and Midway, I'm sure <laughs> you've smelled jet fuel, right? And, and, and so there are, I, I, again, local things that you can do when you're talking about mega cities, whether it's just research on urban heat island effect, um, research on precipitation runoff, urban flooding, uh, nuisance, what we call nuisance flooding. Tallahassee has to deal with this a lot, not necessarily flash flooding, but just what we call nuisance flooding. Um, and, and really for a place like Chicago, the question then becomes water resources. Um, freshwater resources, if you're relying on things like Lake Michigan, well, if you look at the lake levels recently, I mean, you know, those sort of issues are things that mega cities are going to be wrestling with as we go forward in the next 100 years as well. And there are climate researchers that are looking at that on a very local scale problem, including in Chicago. So thank you all so much uh, for talking with us tonight. And for the next portion of the event, we are going to continue to talk with Victor and John and open it up to questions from the audience. So I'd like to thank Jeff Vandermeer so much uh, for all your ideas and uh, sharing your expertise with us tonight. Oh, I enjoyed it. And I very much enjoyed listening to Victor and John. So thank you. It's a pleasure talking with you too. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. All right, at this time, I'm going to invite Victor Gensini and John Shelton back into the room. Welcome. And as we're looking for more questions from our participants, I have a question for uh, John and Victor. So I know, John, especially you were talking about some of the sci-fi that you love, like uh, Star Trek and um, uh, Stargate. So did Either of you read science fiction uh, as a child, as a young adult, how did that influence uh, some of the things that you have been researching? Uh, yeah, I did. I, I did read a few bits of science fiction. Um, I think probably one of the first books I read, it was a book series called uh, Mrs. Pickerno, uh, way back in the day. I don't even know if they even have that, but it was uh, about a, uh, a lady that would go on all these science fiction adventures, whether it was uh, something that had to do with nuclear or whatever the case may be. But uh, that was probably one of the first books I really got into way back in the day. Um, and since then, I've read some of the, the classics too. So uh, you know, 1984, uh, Brave New World. Um, uh, I think I read, uh, what's the one, the, the one with the, the science lab? where they encounter something in space. I forgot the name, but that's, that's about it. <laughs> All right, how about you, Victor? This is gonna sound weird, but I was, I was really into uh, Jack Kerouac novels <laughs> as, a young, as a young person. I said, remember when I was talking to Jeff and like part of my brain, right? I'm a quantitative person, but um, yeah, I'm trying to think of some of my favorite books growing up at um, the Monkey Wrench Gang. I was really into travel novels across the U.S., but I loved science fiction, so, but more so in movies. I like uh, which were actually some came out of, of books, Jurassic Park, Back to the Future, right? Some of those novels uh, uh, and, and classic movies uh, that, that really make us dream about what science uh, could be like if we were able to, to really let our minds run wild. So um, I do enjoy all types of science fiction. Um, it just so happens most of my research is, is really focused on, on nonfiction. All right. And it looks like we have a question from the audience about megacities. So is this something happening due to sprawl or is it something that's being planned by communities? Likewise, who is talking to the communities and counties about the impact of megacities and this building that's uh, happening? 
The cause of megacities, from what I've seen in the literature, is due to uh, climate change as well as due to uh, labor. A lot of the jobs that are needed are in the cities, and, and a lot of the migration that has occurred uh, to the cities is due to climate change, the lack of water in some of the more fertile lands areas of the world, they have kind of dried up and so they're looking for work. And so they're going to places where there are more opportunities for work. And so that is mainly occurring in uh, third world countries or developing worlds, uh, developing countries where there is uh, a migration from being a, a, a food producing country to more of a, a technologically based economy. So I think that's interesting, and maybe it's too early to tell, but some people have predicted that because of the pandemic and because of people working from home, that it will expand cities out of their traditional region. So we'll get, you know, additional suburbs and things like that. Is that something that you see as a possibility? So uh, from what I've heard uh, in recent weeks, actually, it appears that that may be temporary where people may try to start slowly migrate, or maybe that's just wishful think thinking among realtors who want people to come back to the city. But uh, I, I do think that people uh, are, are, are in, the, in the middle of making that decision right now, of whether they want to make that change from where they are currently working at home to going back into the city and trying to deal with the lifestyle of living in the city again. Okay, and we have another question uh, somewhat related to this, that uh, do mega cities contribute to an increase in diseases like COVID uh, based on how closely people are living together? Well, actually it, it turns out that it, it does and it may not even occur in the way that we might think it does. Uh, I think we've had some students here at Northern Illinois University uh, look at uh, the way our waste is being not just waste water but just waste itself how it's being distributed through through our network of of infrastructure and seeing that it's actually a very contributory in the way that our ability to have things distributed through our system is increased so for example uh, we had some students looking at the COVID-19 how that is going into our wastewater sewer system and seeing if they can measure the quantity or the concentration of the COVID-19 um, virus in our wastewater. And they're seeing that it actually, uh, it distributes very well. It kind of is correlated to concentrations of population centers relative to what's going on in the concentration of the water that's there. Hmm. Okay, and we have another question. I saw a documentary about moving the nation's capital because Washington DC is on a swamp and monuments and structures are sinking. Chicago and New York City are also built on wetlands. How will megacities impact the ability of the land to support the building and infrastructure? Oh, uh, it's a very good question. Um, I, might have to, I might have to get back to you on that one. That's a really good question. <laughs> Okay, let's see. And as a reminder, if you have additional questions, you can put them in the Q&A box. And so you talked a little bit about this in the interview, but how have both of you seen a shift in ideas about climate change and climate disruptions in your students? Has that been ramping up in local or in um, the recent years, recent months? What, what are the trends? Well, certainly on the atmospheric science uh, side of the house, there's always been, I think, interest in global climate change. Um, in, the, in the most recent 10 years, I can say without any hesitation at all that the number of students coming out of high school are perhaps uh, more passionate than ever about what they can specifically do in the science realm to ask and try to answer questions related to climate change, whether that's how perils will change in the future, uh, what those perils, what ch those changing peril landscape might mean for uh, society. 
they're they're extra i think and, and john actually alluded to this uh in his one of his answers at the very end of the of the of the recorded video uh they're they just care more about environmental issues um but you know i think and i think traditionally in meteorology if you look back we're a very very young science i mean we really only have been around since you know the satellite era in the 1970s i mean you can trace our roots back to to uh, really the first numerical weather prediction going back to maybe Benjamin Franklin. I mean, we're, we're relatively young science. And so most of it's always been geared on forecasting, right? What's tomorrow's weather going to be like? But now it's becoming more and more important to, to become a broadly trained, what we call meteorologist, climatologist. Um, and that's what these students are getting. And that's what they're passionate about. And I, I'm really happy with the trajectory uh, that that our students are coming in with, or they're, I think that not just their knowledge base, but really what they want to do and what they want to contribute to society as far as environmental change, climate justice, climate prediction. Um, it's really encouraging. And I think something that uh, if you go back to our answers in the video, something that we can be very, very hopeful about. Okay. And we have another question from uh, the audience. Do you know of any organized weather change curriculum for younger primary and secondary school students? Great question. Um, atmospheric science, meteorology in general, is not usually something that's taught a lot in um, elementary education. Sometimes if you get to high school, you might have an earth science unit, and then I'm over here going, woohoo, right? Great. Um, the weather stuff is there. There's a lot of curriculum out there through NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They have something called Jetstream. It's their online weather school. It's all free curriculum um, that you can go. There are PowerPoints. There are coloring books. I mean, there's all kinds of really, really great resources out there um, for, for K through 12 uh, when it comes to weather. Climate is not there yet. Um, the Probably the best curriculum out there right now is through the American Meteorological Society, the AMS. They are basically uh, the umbrella organization that oversees weather and climate uh, in the United States, at least. And they do have curriculum out there that is open source. It's just a little bit harder to find. And it's not something I think that a lot of high school educators really have a lot of experience with. I mean, this is not something that they were taught in school, right? And they're relying on external uh, you know, experts in the field to be able to teach them before they can go into the classroom and feel comfortable teaching younger students. So um, it's still evolving and I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have better curriculum, especially in the grade schools, uh, because they tend to take that information home to mom and dad, right? Or, or, or family members or friends or neighbors. Um, they're the ones who are oftentimes spreading a lot of that information throughout the household and throughout their community. So I do agree that uh, that should be a, a really big um, focus for us over the next 10 years is to get that curriculum into the hands of younger kids. And um, luckily, because we're a part of NIU STEAM here at the university, I do know that NIU STEAM has been working on some meteorology programs in their STEAM studios. So if you go to uh, the NIU STEAM website, which we'll have at the end of the program, you can find information on that. There's also summer camps and a backyard naturalist program, which we think about the idea of getting these ideas into, uh, you know, the the backyards of our of our students and of our kids they're doing that here and um i also just learned last night that uh dekalb has become a um monarch city <laughs> it's officially a monarch city so they're doing a lot of native planting and a lot of education for uh kids and the community about native planting so that's a really interesting thing to look for too uh, let's see, what are your thoughts about U.S. and China's impending partnership in climate change? Do you see a large change or a reverse of the climate situation? Well, I, you know, the, certainly with everything that's happened in the last year, I mean, um, for whatever reason, I, I guess for some re good reason, whether it's trade, whether it's, um, you know, the, the whole uh, facilitation of this this idea of the China virus, which just makes me so upset when I hear that word that was propagated throughout our society. 
of somehow they're our adversary. Um, yeah, we compete with them. I, I don't think there's any, there's any doubt. Um, we are the two leading global economies and we are responsible for a disproportionate share of climate and greenhouse gas emissions. And thus on, it's on us as developed countries, developed nations to lead in the climate change and engineering green space to set examples for developing nations that are often disproportionately uh, do not have the means, whether it's technological means, financial means, societal means to adapt their societal workflows uh, to more green and renewable energy. Um, and so in that way, I'm hopeful that the China, China and the US will again, United States get back to the Paris right? climate agreement. I think that's, that's number one, but we need to start to lead again in the climate space because um, unfortunately um, over, our, over the previous administration, we lost a significant amount of traction globally uh, when it comes to reducing carbon emissions and really partnering with other countries uh, due to our withdrawal from the Paris climate agreement. So we're, I, I think I would speak for many climate scientists to say that we're gonna be very, very optimistic and, and happy now that we're moving in, in a positive direction again after four years of, uh, of really moving backwards. Yeah. And I have another question about um, mega cities. Let's see. Is it preferable for sustainability purposes for the continuing trend of growing mega cities, more people moving from rural to urban environments, or should we instead focus on encouraging sustainable and spread out populations because we can do so much more virtually now? Uh, well, I, I think uh, I have an. Uh, two-pronged answer to that question. One is, is a practical one and one is a idealistic one. Uh, the practical one version of the answer is that yes, I do think we need to find a way to incorporate a distributed lifestyle more into like the, our current living style uh, better uh, in that so we are able to no longer rely so heavily on these concentrations of populations in order to sustain economies, because that's the model that we've had for a very long time. However, in the idealistic case, um, I, I do tend to gravitate towards space travel. I, I, and so in order for space travel to occur or space living to occur, maybe for example, in Mars or even to get to Mars, we have to have models for sustainable living. In order to you know, get to Mars, it takes about 18 months, almost two years, even to sustain life on Mars or even any other planet, we're gonna have to find a way to concentrate our living in very small locations and being able to develop these models here on earth using the concept of more mega cities in a way that we can adapt these models to other locations. I think that we can definitely learn a lot from that and apply that into, uh, you know, going going somewhere outside of our current living planet. <laughs> Control Earth, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so one of the things that's really interesting when we start to talk about climate change is that it can be a subject that just turns people off because it seems so overwhelming. But what I really liked about what all of you were saying tonight was that the way to start is to start locally and to find the things that you can do because it's never too late. So what are some of the projects that you see going on um, in your university, in your community, in your own backyard that you're really excited, excited about as a step forward? I'll start first. Um... At the local level, one of the things that I did was just try to get involved politically. So I wrote my incoming congresswoman in the 14th district, um, Lauren Underwood, and asked her to be on her science advisory panel to advise her about climate change and issues happening in Illinois 14th district. I figured my scientific expertise is just the tiny little bit of mouth that I could give her um, would be beneficial. She's a decision maker, right? She's in Congress. She can influence policy and decision making, uh, not only for the residents of Illinois 14, um, but for uh, the residents of the, of the states at large. Um, of course, it can be even more local than that. It can be 
you know, the, the way that you treat your yard. <laughs> um, it could be LED light bulbs in your house. I'm, John probably has a list of, of things that we could do uh, on a daily basis to, to conserve energy. Um, and especially now with, with travel, um, the reduction in travel that we've seen. I'm really happy that NIU has taken a step forward and hired a sustainability coordinator, uh, Dr. Courtney Gallagher in our department, who's really gonna be overseeing day-to-day -day ways on campus that we can be more efficient and reduce our wastes um, and, and overall become a more sustainable university, at least for our university community. I think that's a huge win for NIU. Um, and then, of course, I think the things that we do locally are just going to, you know, hopefully branch out um, and become, as John mentioned in our, in our video, uh, be more permeable and uh, really become, instead of changing our ways, they'll become second nature to all of us. Uh, I think uh, I would also add to what Victor mentioned, uh, something that he had talked about before, which is finding ways to incorporate sustainable thinking into our K through 12 curriculum. Our current curriculum in K through 12 is somewhat rigid. And it's very, sometimes it's a little bit inflexible because the, the, the dedicated pathways people have and the students have in order to get into college. But if we can find ways to get into the curriculum with, for example, with the climate science, climate investigation, with teaching our, our teachers that information or whether it's sustainable living or sustainable engineering, or something along those lines where it's not necessarily curricular, but maybe co-curricular. And we're able to supplement some of the information they are already learning in the classroom with things that may attract students to the topic that they can probably build upon once they leave the school or they go back home or they go into college. They'll be coming into those environments already prepared to tackle those topics. And I think getting into the classroom at a younger and younger age would be an excellent way to, to increase the, the appetite for sustainable living, for, for climate science, for climate change, for finding ways to have more sustainable living. Yeah, absolutely. And I've definitely noticed that in my own family that we were home, we're home all the time. And we go to our yard now and we look at all the weird bugs that we can find. And, you know, every moment can be a teachable moment because you have this great classroom in your own backyard or right outside of your door. So um, another thing that NIU STEAM is doing is we have uh, STEAM literacy nights where we combine uh, science and poetry and look at fun ways to get kids excited about the environment through uh, great storytelling and everything from uh, Shel Silverstein poems to newer books like Maple. So, so there are things going on. So I do encourage you uh, at home to look at uh, STEM Read and Northern Illinois University as a place to start, but there are lots of great resources out there. So um, final thoughts, we're just about out of time. Um, final thoughts from Victor or John. I don't have any. I just want to thank everyone for tuning in and listening to our discussion with Jeff. And I certainly learned so much from Jeff and John and uh, appreciate all the great questions. And uh, I really hope that we can all, you know, this is something that I, we, I lecture on all the time and I feel like we step away and we forget about it, right? We can become complacent. Um, in our ways. And if I think if the pandemic has taught us anything, uh, it shows us how quickly life can change and how fast things can turn upside down. Um, and I look at it as an opportunity. I think we could all, um, you know, think about ways to continue our energy efficiency as we begin to transition back into quote unquote normal. Uh, you know, I think this is something that we're, it will be something that I think we wrestle with uh, in the very, very, well, we're wrestling with it now, but it's going to become more and more important as we go forward over the next 50, 100 years. I don't think there's any question about that. The global pandemics are always going to be up there at the top of the list now, and climate change has been up there and will continue to be such a, an important future, uh, an important topic for uh, generations to come. So, yeah, just want to say thank you to everyone for tuning in. Thank you. And John? Uh, there's not much more to add to that. You know, I just want to thank Victor and Jeff for our interesting conversation this evening and also for um, 
Dr. Barnhart and for you, Jillian, and everybody to help coordinate everything. This has been a really uh, good experience. And I thank you, thank you to everyone to, who attended and all your great questions. I really did enjoy the evening. Yes. Well, thank you both so much. And thanks um, also to NIU STEAM and the Friends of the Libraries who support these great future telling events. And if you go to the future telling website, niu.edu slash future telling, you can support it as well. And I'd also like to just give a shout out to Jeff Vandermeer because um, our authors are supported through Friends of the Library. They get a, an honorarium for participating in this. And Jeff Vandermeer was kind enough to donate his honorarium back to the university to a sustainability program here. And the program that we chose was uh, Save the NIU East Lagoon, which is a uh, student um, initiative that came up. And their aim is to restore the shoreline of the East Lagoon through collaboration with volunteers, the environmental studies and geology department with the goal of bringing the community together to provide more opportunities for education and engagement on campus. And they're doing things like uh, researching soil change, biodiversity, what to plant, water quality, uh, preventing geese, and uh, looking for ways to combat invasive species. So if you want to learn more about that program, you could go to Save the NIU East Lagoon on Facebook. So thanks again to all my guests, and um, we'll be putting the credits back up so you can see some of the websites we referenced here tonight. So. Have a wonderful night and happy Earth Day. And thank you all so much for participating.